How many of, of you have ever been wronged, seriously wronged, by someone? Maybe even someone that you love, maybe a close neighbor, maybe a brother, a family friend. Well, most of us have in one way or another. I won't ask you all to lift your hands up. I can tell by some of the looks on your face, though, that you may have gone through that. We all have gone through that at one point or another, and it can, it can leave us feeling disoriented, angry, depressed, and if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes even questioning God. In Obadiah's day, Judah had been invaded, and her enemies were celebrating their victory in Jerusalem. And even their close relatives, the Edomites, descended from Jacob's brother Esau, had betrayed them and not only stood aloof, which we'll see in, in verse 3, but also celebrated and participated in the violence against their brother Jacob. Now, does that sound familiar to anything that's in the, in the headlines today? We see the same thing still going on. The Lord God gave the prophet Obadiah a vision to answer the question that he knew that the people had, where is the justice? But unlike Amos and Joel that are just before uh, Obadiah in the arrangement of the Old Testament, Obadiah in the Minor Prophets, Amos and Joel prophesy against the northern kingdom and against the southern kingdom of Judah respectively, but Obadiah was not addressed at all to the Israelites, but to the descendants of Esau, the Edomites. And, God, uh, and God's answer to that question that he knew that the people had, where is the justice? His answer to that question is, wait for it. And we don't often like to hear that answer, but that's often the answer that we have as well when we're wronged or when something tragic befalls us and we know that someone or some group of people is responsible for an evil. And many times God tells us, wait for it, wait for my justice. He's omniscient, he's just, he's merciful, and he's long-suffering, our God, even with these, quote, evil people that we want often to see judged. But that's what it takes for the believer in a moment of, of uh, suffering like that, especially at the hands of uh, close relatives, is we have to focus on the character of our God and his promises to never leave us or forsake us. Obadiah's vision from, from Yahweh in this little book focuses initially on Edom, and we're going to look into that, Jacob's brother and his descendants, who should have helped rather than stood aloof and betrayed their close relative. But the focus later in the book, as we'll see in the second hour, uh, and it's only one chapter, we'll see that the focus of the prophetic focus moves and broadens out to all the nations at the end of the book. Edom's uh, pronounced judgment serves as a warning for all the nations. And Edom serves as a type or an example of peoples that align themselves against the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and against his chosen people, the Israelites. Obadiah is a national death sentence handed down by the supreme judge of the universe on the Edomites. It's a very serious book. Let's go ahead and get into it. If, if you haven't got there yet, I know it's a small little book. If you thumb through the prophets in the Old Testament and you get to Jonah, back up just a little bit and you'll find it. Now, how many of you, this time I am going to maybe ask for a, a show of hands. How many of you have ever met an Edomite? Have you ever had a neighbor that, you, that, you, that moved in from out of town and said, Hey, I'm uh, Esau, the Edomite. Nobody? No. Why do you think that is? Because God's already carried out this, this national death sentence. It's a serious thing. There, you won't meet an Edomite today. 
Because God's sentence on the Edomites has been carried out. Somewhere around the 600s BC, a group of Arabs called the Nabataeans conquered Edom and absorbed many of them and scattered the remaining Edomites into an area called Edomia in the south of Judah. And we'll see more about that in a little bit. And it was Edom's chief, what was Edom's chief crime that led to this national death penalty? We'll, we're going to see it in verse 3. He, he says, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. Pride. Pride was the ultimate sin of Edom that eventually caused God um, to pronounce this judgment on the entire people. God announces early in the book that it was Edom's arrogant pride that led to her downfall. Not only that, but the pride, uh, that, that the pride that she had caused self-delusion. And that's why pride is the most deadly of the sins, because it deceives us. When we're proud, we are also deceiving ourselves. If I'm caught in a sin of outburst of anger or jealousy, that's a sin for, those are sins for sure. But what keeps me from confessing my sins? It's not the jealousy, it's not the outburst of anger, but it's my pride. So that's why the sin of pride is so um, heinous, because it stands in the way of us returning back to our God. And it's the same thing, you see it throughout the scriptures. James says that God makes war against the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Why was Jesus a stumbling block to the, the religious leaders of his day? Because of their pride. So this is, a, this is a human condition. This is, of course, the original sin. If you remember the story, the original story of the two brothers that we're going to be looking at today, uh, Jacob and Esau, they were the fathers of the two nations, Jacob, who later became Israel after he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, and Esau, or Edom. So who was Esau? Well, he was a mighty hunter. The Bible tells us that he was a mighty hunter. And his father, Isaac, loved him very much because it says that, that uh, Isaac had a taste for game. So, now Esau was an arrogant brute of a man, though, and thought that he was self-sufficient. See, he had faith in his flesh. He had faith in his ability as a, as a skilled hunter to provide. Now, of course, as men, we're, we're supposed to provide, but he had his, his faith was in his own ability and his strength, and the, and the scriptures bear that out. Today... Esau would probably live off grid and have a giant lifted UTV and a couple of AR-15s in the back of his, of his uh, UTV, right, in the gun rack. So that's the kind of guy that, that Esau was. He was very uh, brash and self-confident, but he also he, he relied on himself rather than God. And he was a very good hunter, but one day he returned thoroughly exhausted from a taxing hunt, and he sold his birthright to his deceiving brother Jacob for some red stew that Jacob had prepared. And so his name became Edom, which uh, the Hebrew word means red, Edom. His pride was wounded. And it led him to self-deceive himself into caring about the immediate need of his hunger, of his belly, more than the more, much more important privileges and obligations of a firstborn to continue on the family's legacy. See, he had that responsibility as the firstborn. He, he was going to be the one through whom the line continued, uh, at least uh, that's the, the tradition, although... God had predicted that the older would serve the younger. 
But today, <clears throat> we are consumed as a society by immediate gratification, are we, are we not? We are a society of prideful, deceived e- Edom, or Esau's, if you will. What was the original sin of Lucifer, the archangel? Well, it was pride. He said, I will, be, I will make myself like who? Like the Most High. <clears throat> and what was the sin that was crouching, waiting to master, uh, master the first murderer in the garden, or after the garden, after Genesis 3, Cain? It was pride. If you think about that story, what revelation did Cain have? Cain had the revelation that God had prepared skins for his parents when they fell, right? And it came time to bring a sacrifice. And his brother Abel, what did he bring? He brought an animal sacrifice that was in alignment with the revelation that they already had. But what did Cain try to bring? Cain tried to bring the fruit of his hands. Literally, the fruit of his work. He was trying to come to God in pride and through his own human efforts. And when, those, when that sacrifice was rejected, his countenance fell. And it eventually, that pride led him to murder his brother Abel. And so it goes on today as it has since the fall. The book of Obadiah, as we mentioned, is a death sentence proclaimed by the sovereign judge of the universe against the nation Edom and delivered by the prophet Obadiah. The announcement, the sentence was delivered by Obadiah. Obadiah means worshiper of Yahweh, and not a lot is known about this prophet, who he was exactly or when he received this vision. But the subject deals with the evils that Edom has done to Judah, to Judah her brother, to her close relative. That's, the, that's a key theme in the book. It's most likely that I, Obadiah lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, there were at least seven, seven occasions in the history of Judah, of the southern kingdom, when foreign armies, inf- armies inflicted a defeat of one kind or another on Jerusalem, culminating, of course, with the destruction of Solomon's temple, by the Babylonians in 586 with the last deportation, what we know as the Babylonian exile. Although some scholars think that Obadiah was written after this conquering of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 586, personally, I don't see that because in verse 13, Obadiah um, of Obadiah is a warning to the Edomites still, even after the sentence or in the midst of the sentence, and it says, do not enter the gates of Jerusalem and gloat. Well, if that, if that destruction had, uh, had already happened, there were no gates to, to enter, uh, you know, the destruction of 586 because the Babylonians raised the temple and destroyed it. So that's just my, my uh, take on it. It really doesn't matter exactly when for us to understand uh, what God has, has preserved for us in the Old Testament, if it was after 586 or another time. But, and, and I know that's an argument from silence, but in my mind, Obadiah would have mentioned the complete and thorough destruction of the temple had it already happened. Okay, I don't know if that makes much sense to you, but regardless, it was what we do know is that, is that Judah had recently been invaded and that their brother, their close relative, the Edomites, not only first stood aloof, meaning did nothing. So that's a, that's a sin of what? We have sins of commission and we have sins of omission. So we'll get into that. But, but the Edomites only, not only stood aloof, but then they participated in the celebration of the conquerors of their, brother, of their brothers, Jacob. Both Jeremiah and Amos seem to quote Obadiah, and so this letter was probably written around 830 B.C. sometime in the reign of Jehoram. Although we don't know exactly when um, Obadiah was written, we, we do uh, need to understand who the Edomites were in order to understand we have to go back to the patriarchs. 
And so I'm going to read to you from Genesis 25, 21 through 34. You can turn there if you want. Genesis 25, 21 through 34. It says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord said to answer him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. So she was going to have twins. And she said, if it is so, why am I this way? So when she went to inquire, so she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. This is God giving Rebecca a direct prophecy. And two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be the stronger and the other, the older, shall serve the younger. So this is, this is a prophecy, a promise that God makes to Rebecca before the boys were born. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came forth all forth red, all over in hairy, like a hairy garment, and they named him, named him Esau, which means hairy. <laughs> Afterward, his brother came forth uh, with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. And uh, Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. So Jacob is chiseler or deceiver. So the, 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 fa- the fact that Jacob was trying to grab his brother's heel and come out first uh, says something that's very uh, foreshadowing to these, these characters. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because of, he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which means red. But Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So of what use then is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him and he sold him his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau the uh, bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way, and Esau despised his birthright. So this was a very serious thing to God that Esau despised his birthright. Again, this is a picture of a person that is focused only on earthly things, immediate needs, instant gratification. That's Esau. He's not looking to the things of the future, the things of the Lord. He's, he's very earthly and he represents uh, the nations outside of covenant with Yahweh. Although he was the older son, Esau despised his birthright, right? And of course, uh, God knew beforehand that this would happen. And he told Rebekah that the older will serve the younger. The promised seed uh, line would come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. And that's important. The red soup that Esau exchanged for his birthright became uh, not only his name, Edom, meaning red, but also emblematic of a people who would come from Islam. They were an earthy people, focused not on the things of God, who despised and disregarded Yahweh's covenants. You know, I was listening to a a podcast recently with, with Sean McDowell. Some of you may know his father, Josh McDowell, that wrote, the wonderful book, great reference book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And uh, Sean has actually helped him write another edition of it. But he was talking to a woman that had converted from Islam. And it was a fascinating conversation. And he was asking her, at one, at one point he asked her, what, what scripture really uh, spoke to you in your conversion from Islam to Christ? And do you know what she said? Genesis chapter 12 through 18. Because see, the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, changed her mind. She had been told in Islam that the promise came through who? Ishmael. 
But when she looked at the Word of God and the Holy Spirit taught her from the Word of God that no, the promises come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That changed her whole worldview. And she knew that she had been lied to and she knew that she had believed a lie. So a con literal, consistent hermeneutic uh, going back is, is what changed her mind. I thought that was fascinating. The disregard or hatred of God's covenants through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are rebellion against the Creator Himself. And we're starting to see that more and more in our country. We'll get into that a little bit in the second hour. The rejection of God's covenants with the patriarchs is still prevalent today, not just in Islam, but also a large portion of the body of Christ in the form of something called replacement theology. And we'll look at that a little bit too in, in, in the second hour, a little bit more. But for now, we just need to know that the Edomites were descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. Okay, everybody clear on that? And so that they, so they were relatives. They were a close group of people, cousins, if you will, to the Hebrews. And this is what made their treachery, um, their consistent treachery, more heinous in the eyes of God. One commentary says that, that uh, regarding this relationship between the two brothers and the two peoples, because they were close relatives to the, the Israelites, because they were close relatives, the Israelites were forbidden to hate the Edomites. They were forbidden to hate the Edomites. Hold on to that. In Deuteronomy 23, 7, which says, Do not despise an Edomite, for the Edomites are related to you. Okay? In Numbers 20, the Edomites refused the Exodus generation passage through their land after they had been rescued uh, from Egypt by the Lord. This was a big national sin on their behalf. They, they refused to let their brother go through their land. Also, another commentator says that the Edomites were such a thorn in the Israelite side that, quote, other than the superpowers, okay, like Egypt and Babylon and uh, Syria, Edom is mentioned more than any other nation as an enemy of Israel in Scripture. Isn't that something? Other than the superpowers, Edom is mentioned more as an adversary of, the, of God's people, and, they were yet, and yet they were the close relatives of the Hebrews. The Edomites considered themselves shrewd, and they were a proud and arrogant people, just like their forefather, Esau. They made their homes high in a cliff in the highlands uh, uh, of the south of the uh, south of the Dead Sea, thinking their fortresses were impenetrable. They not only opposed their brothers, whom they were supposed to serve, but aligned themselves with Israel's enemies. So, very quickly, simple little outline of Obadiah as we get into it. Obadiah is laid out in four sections. The, the first is verses 1 through 9, uh, God's announcement in the vision from Obadiah of the sentence of destruction for the Edomites. Secondly, the evidence of Edom's crime. So, he's going to announce the death sentence, and then he's going to say, this is why. He's going to read the charges that... that that Edom is guilty of. The second two, we'll get into the, in the second hour, the, 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 the third Roman, Roman numeral of the outline, God's future judgment on all the nations. Remember how I said he was going to zoom out? He's talking about judgment on Edom, then he's going to zoom out to all the nations and apply uh, God's judgment in the day of the Lord to all the nations that, that will eventually all come up against Israel. And then finally, God's future blessing on Israel, verses 17 through 21. And so with all that in back, uh, background in mind, let's get into book, the book of Obadiah. And we'll start together in verse 1, which I have on the, the slide. Give you a second to turn back to Obadiah. I should have had you put your finger in it because in, in it, it's so easy to miss. <clears throat> I'll have it up on the screen anyway, though. Verse 1 says, The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise and let us go to battle, go against her for battle. 
the vision or hazan uh, is the word here, meaning a vision or revelation was given to the prophet Obadiah by God. The prophet uh, Obadiah is merely announcing what God has revealed concerning how he will bring justice to Edom. Thus says the Lord God introduces the formal sentence from the divine judge of all creation on the Edomites. And, and because God, the, the Holy Spirit, has seen fit to preserve this small letter for the church, we can see in it God's prerogative in judging nations when and how he sees fit and for what reasons he sees fit. Okay, we'll see the pride and the arrogance being the, the chief factor in God's judgment against Edom. <clears throat> Edom, uh, evil's done to, God judges Edom because of the evil's done to his people. And they don't escape his notice, and that's, and that's the point of it. He's answering the, the question that the people have, where's the justice, God? You, you've, let, you've let your land be overrun again, right? So my, my take on the editorial, we here in, in verse 1, is that it, that it refers to God's angelic uh, council and the envoy uh, is an, on, an angelic envoy that God has sent. Okay, uh, that's the best I understand it to stir up the nations against the Edomites. Now it may just be uh, language, figurative language that God that shows that God is working through history. That's fine too, but uh, but it seems to indicate that an envoy was sent. Right? An envoy was sent to do what? To go out among all the nations and stir them up for battle against Edom. So God is going to use the armies that are around to judge Edom. Just like he used the armies around to judge his people, right? He's going to do that um, to the descendants of Esau. Either way, the prophet is announcing that when the nations rise up together to go against Edom... It will be because the Lord has sent them to judge Edom. Verse 2 says, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. See, the Edomite considered themselves to be greater than they actually were. They thought that their geography, high, their, their high, the high ground they, they possessed, and their, alliance, their alliances crafted by their wise leaders, um, made them untouchable. However, the Lord was going to show them how small he would make them very soon. And in fact, that arrogance had made, the, uh, had made them despised among the nations. So a lot of times when we're acting in pride, we think people can't notice it, but it's, it's everyone around us sees it and they're turned off by it, right? And that's, and that's kind of what, what he's saying, what, 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 there's, what the Lord is saying here that you're, you're already greatly despised because you think you're so untouchable and that's how you come across to your neighbors. You think you have all these alliances that you've made because you're so wise and you're so smart. Your neighbors can see right through that. They can see through your arrogance. They can see the way that you look down at them and they despise you and they're getting ready to, come, to join together and deceive you and uh, make you small, as he says. Verse 3 the arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? So here we see the root sin of Edom. Like their forefather Esau, they were proud people who thought that they could be self-reliant and self-sufficient. Again, the story of Jacob and Esau, the two literal brothers, is played out in the nations themselves. Esau was this great hunter who thought he was an apex predator and he didn't need anyone else. But what happened to him? Well, he returned from the, the hunt famished and he gave up his birthright, right? So now the proud Edomites, so sure of their security, occupying the high ground in the cliffs, repeat the same sin of their namesake, uh, Esau or Edom, uh, in their sin of pride, and as it'll be the, their national downfall. 
So what kind of principles can we take from that? Well, our nation has long endured and enjoyed peace and security because of our geographical position, right? We're between these two oceans. We're far away from that old European order that, that, that so often sprung into uh, chaos and, and wars. But more and more, <clears throat> he's taking that sense of security away from us, is he not? Our nation was founded on biblical principles, but we have become arrogant, thinking that we're self-sufficient. With an unmatched military, we have the high ground, right? We have the best air force in the world, and now we're building space force. But more and more, our public displays of gratitude, like at a, at a football game or a baseball game, what are our public displays of gratitude anymore? Are they to, to thank the Lord God that founded and preserved our country? The best we can do usually, I'll, I'll give baseball credit. Baseball still sings God Bless America in the seventh inning, right? But as far as when we have a moment of silence or a moment of gratitude, it's a gratitude toward our troops, right? And that's wonderful. We want, we're patriotic as, as Christians. We, we, uh, but if that's as high as our national gratitude goes, we're in trouble. Because God makes the arrogant, brings the arrogant down. And like the other nations that we'll see later on in verses 15 and 16, God will judge all nations. Especially when we add to all the, our other evils a rising anti-Semitism that's growing by leaps and bounds, both on the left and on the right in this country. On the left and college campuses, I'm sure that if you've watched any news, you see the um, Palestinian protests. And then also on the right, on the hard right, if you will, the, in the, on the conspiracy theorist circles online, there's, a, of course, a rise in, in anti-Semitism. And we'll look into that, like I said, in the second hour. Verse 4, though you build high to Edom, again, though you build high like the eagle, <laughs> like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Now, it's interesting that God even uses an eagle. That Maybe that speaks to us today. Of course, I'm not saying that God is prophesying about the nation of Israel here, but, but he uses a picture of an eagle as what? Something that's above, that's an apex predator that's above uh, uh, being attacked. And so they, they uh, use the eagle as their national symbol, apparently. But like the eagle, they built their nest or their fortresses high, among the stars, but he says it's from there that he will bring them down. And of course, rather than being than a humble reliance upon Yahweh or the Creator God, they relied on them themselves and their own strength and their own wit, and that's what he's judging them for. Verse, verses five and six read, "If thieves came to you, okay, he's saying to Edom, if thieves came to you, if robbers by night." Oh, how you will be ruined. But would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasure, treasures will be stretched out. So here he's saying, if thieves came to your house at night, they can only take so much. Right? They can only basically take what they can carry and then leave under the cover of darkness. And if workers are out uh, picking grapes in a field, they would leave, traditionally they would leave some gleanings. If you all remember the book of Ruth, that's how Ruth came humbly to the land and, got, and gathered the gleanings and got the attention of her kinsman redeemer Boaz. But he's saying it won't be like that. When I judge you, Esau, there will be no gleanings. 
There will be nothing left. Your house will be ransacked. So this is very strong judgment from the Lord on Edom, Jacob's brother. Verse 7 says, All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border. And the men at peace with, with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread. Interesting. Wasn't Jesus betrayed by, by someone who ate bread with him? They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in him. So God would use this very sin of pride, of national pride, to bring about Edom's destruction. The Edomites thought so highly of themselves that they couldn't see how their alliances, how their allies really despised them and would set an ambush for them. The Edomites would first be deceived by their own pride, and then they would be deceived by their enemies, or their allies that ended up being enemies. And isn't that the, the deceptiveness of our own prideful sin nature? When we're walking in the flesh, even as believers, our own pride deceives us well before the adversary does. So concerning um, when this, this prophecy of Obadiah verse 7 was fulfilled, Walter Baker in the Bible Knowledge Commentary says this, Another point of irony, and I have it up on the screen, another point of irony in Obadiah 7 is that Edom, known for her wise men, would be totally ignorant of her allies' deceptive scheme. This downfall referred to here prob probably occurred in the late 6th or early 5th century B.C. when the Nabataeans, which was, uh, like we've mentioned, was a group of Arab, uh, nomadic Arab tribe, went to the Edomites who took them in for a banquet. Once welcomed inside Edomite territory, the Nabataeans turned against their ally and killed the guards. This is what we referred to a little bit earlier. So Edom welcomed in her own destruction because of her uh, arrogance and her pride. So you want to know how po poetic this judgment from God was? Well, who were the Nabataeans? Well, they were a nomadic Arabic tribe descended from a man by the name of Nebaioth, if I'm saying that right, Neb Nebaioth. And who was he the son of? Well, he was the son of Ishmael. Nebaioth was the son of Ishmael, the father of the Nabataeans, and brother-in-law to Esau. So God used Edom's close relative to betray her just as she had betrayed Esau just as Esau, the Edomites, had betrayed their brother Jacob. So God is very poetic in his just, justice many times. And he, he says later in the book, as you have done, so it's going to be done to you. Verses 8 and 9 are up on the screen together. Will I, will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman, so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. So notice the repetition declares the Lord here. So again, this is another announcement from the Lord declares the Lord. This is a formal sentencing of the nation of Edom. God is emphasizing that he is sentencing Edom to destruction, even though that sentence will be carried out by Edom's uh, allies. Teman was, uh, you see here uh, in verse 9, O Teman. Teman was Esau's grandson, and the capital city of Edom was named after him. So he, they're using uh, Teman is, is used to represent the whole nation, just as like Zion or Jerusalem often represents the whole nation here. So he's saying, O Teman, uh, so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau. The mountain of Esau is Mount Seir, which the Lord himself had given to Esau in Deuteronomy 2.5. God had given the land to Esau, and now he was going to cut them off from it because of their continued evil in dealing with their brother Jacob. Verse 10 reads, Because of violence to your brother, now he comes to it. 
because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. And here it is, the, the, national, the reason for the national death sentence on Edom was violence to their brother Jacob. So folks, like we've said <clears throat> before, the Abrahamic covenant is still in effect. And so are God's other land covenants with Israel. And don't let anyone, no matter how many theology degrees they have or what, how prestigious their seminary is, tell you any different. That is the literal, plain reading of the text. And God does not stutter. So maybe we don't like that. Maybe some of us have some animosity toward what we see evil being done by certain rich, evil Jews like George Soros or something like that, right? Let's just be honest with ourselves. Maybe sometimes we don't like that. But we can't let that seed of anti-Semitism sprout in our hearts because, in pride because the same fate can await and has awaited many nations when they've come against God's chosen people. And America is no different if we go down that road. And so, as one pastor I like to listen to a lot of times says, folks, I don't write the mail, I just deliver it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> God wrote this verse that you see on the board and preserved it down through the millennia for the church to read this morning together. And I'm here to tell you that uh, we need to be very careful in the area of anti-Semitism as we see it rising in, in our in our society, and as individuals and as a church. So does that mean that we have to excuse and defend everything that the modern secular state of Israel does? No. That's one thing that, that we have to be clear on, that most of Israel is unregenerate. So should we, we be surprised if they act as unregenerate people sometimes? No. But we do need to be aware of the spiritual battle that's going on behind the headlines. Satan is still trying to eliminate that seed. Even though Jesus has come through, he still has promises left for, the, for national Israel, the remnant in the tribulation. And if Satan can destroy and there's no more seed, national seed left, guess what? Jesus can't fulfill his promises. And so that's, that's Satan's aim. He won't be successful at it, but that's his scheme still to this day. So no matter how unpopular it gets to support the national seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in our time, the one question that we need to ask ourselves is, am I aligning with God or with the adversary? And it's very clear. It's a, it's a simple litmus test. How are you treating the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It's for a people, for a church, for a nation. This principle should be a cautionary one for our entire nation as well. God indeed gave this land this, of America to us, to our forefathers, like he gave Mount Seir to Esau. And even with all of the ways that we've turned our back to him as a country, one thing that will be a sure and certain national death sentence for us would be if we turn against uh, God's people that he still has a future for. And with the rising tide of anti-Semitism on the both the left and the right today, this very thing could happen. Um, should we continue on that, on that road or should it, it increase? Verse 11, be the last one I, think, I believe that we'll look at here in the first hour. says, on the day that you stood aloof. Okay, so they stood aloof. On the day that the strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered the gate, his gate, and cast lots for Jerusalem. You too were as one of them. So God is recalling us a certain day in the past when foreigners had raided Jerusalem. But instead of helping their brother Jacob, their first sin was that they stood aloof. They did nothing. How many of you used to watch, I don't know if anybody used to watch Seinfeld, but that was like the, the, the culmination of Seinfeld was that they, they got thrown in jail for, for violating a Good Samaritan law, which they did nothing. 
right? <laughs> so oftentimes we think when we do nothing, it's okay. But what does James tell us? When to, to the one that knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, it is what? Sin. All right, so the, Jacob, uh, Edom's first sin here was doing nothing to help her brother. And then they became as one of them. So exactly what day the Lord is referring to here isn't clear as uh, Jerusalem was attacked, as we mentioned, up to seven times during the divided kingdom span. But God knew exactly what day it was. And he didn't forget it, did he? And that's part of the answer to the question, where's the justice? He's not going to forget. He's going to repay. And so many times when we experience a betrayal, some injustice, uh, maybe someone that we trust swindles us in business or does violence to us or our family. If something like that has happened to you, you need to know that God, that you are a child of God, and he doesn't forget. And he will bring justice for you. Uh, And nothing happens to any of us outside of his notice. The justice for the things that we suffer in this life may not be meted out on our timetable. Very rarely is meted out on the timetable that we want. But God will remember his children. And that's the best thing that we can do uh, when someone's wronged us in one of these, these ways is to pray for repentance for them. And if they aren't believers, pray that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior uh, so that they don't find, find themselves on the eternal death sentence of God for those that have refused to believe in the, the only name, the only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ. So that uh, the same blood that covers your sins by grace can cover theirs as well. That's what we should be praying. The book of Hebrews says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. When we do have a, uh, I do want to get through 12 and 13 before we break. So 12 says, uh, do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people. This is what we mentioned at the very beginning. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster, and do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. So a future day of judgment for Judah and, and uh, Jerusalem, I think, is in view here, meaning that, that day, 586, when, when the Babylonians uh, finally conquered Jerusalem for good and destroyed the temple. And I think that's what's in view in these two verses. Even though God was already pronouncing his national death sentence on the Edomites, he's still warning them not to continue to do the violence, but they're going to continue. The Edomites would do these very things and further seal their own fate. Verse 14 says, Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives and do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. So now he's getting very clear about what they did, right? So when there were people fleeing out of Jerusalem because of the foreign armies, not only did Edom stand aloof, not only did Edom celebrate, but she set herself up in ambush at the fork of the road to cut down the fugitives of their brother coming out and then sold them back to the foreign the invading armies. Rather than helping their brother Jacob, the Edomites added to their calamity. Therefore, this is, this is why God is announcing this national death sentence. So as we conclude this morning, the pictures you see up on the, the board, this is why this, this stuff is so relevant today still. This is not just a dusty old book that has no relevance to our time. The man you see in the white turban was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem during World War II. He was the leader of the sons of Ishmael, Isaac's brother, right? 
He was the leader of the sons of Ishmael at the time, a leader in the Middle East. And how did he treat his brother Jacob, who was also descended from Abraham? Well, he met, he met with Adolf Hitler on November 28, 1941, at the, Reich, at the Reich Chancellery in Berlin and made a secret pact with the Fuhrer. The pact stated that once the German troops had advanced through the Caucasus and thereby opened a gateway to the Middle East, the Nazis would provide materials and aid to the Mufti, who would then call out on a large army of Muslim fighters to help Hitler with his final solution to the Jewish problem. Satan was trying to thwart what he saw was coming and what was coming. The Jews were about to return to their homeland, and he was trying to stop it. And Ishmael's descendants were trying to stop it. Do you see this theme that continues through the, the entire of, entirety of Scripture? But God, of course, had other plans to return the Jews back to their homeland after 2,000 years of exile. So this scheme of the devil didn't materialize. And of course, today, especially in the wake, we just celebrated, or it's not celebrated, observed, I'm sorry, observed the one-year anniversary of the October 7th attacks in Israel um, last week. We see Ishmael's descendants, in large part, still uh, assisting Iran in escalating violence against their brother Jacob. But God is still in control of history, and he will bring all nations, as he has promised uh, to, uh, he will judge all nations, as he has promised to, in the day of the Lord, which we'll see uh, as we finish Obadiah together in the second hour. <clears throat> And this is the answer to the anticipated question that Obadiah is speaking to in his vision. Where is the justice for those proud and violent oppressors of Jacob? Well, God's answer is, it's coming. So let's close in prayer.